If Judge Goddard allowed the prosecution more latitude at the second trial than Judge Kaufman had at the first, he was equally generous to the Hiss defense. And in doing so, he may have given Hiss enough rope to hang himself. Hiss's major new witness at the second trial was Dr. Carl Binger, a licensed psychiatrist in New York City. He would graduated from Harvard and from Harvard Medical School, cum laude, in 1914. He would also studied at Cornell and Vanderbilt. He would worked at Mass General in Boston, Johns Hopkins, and the Rockefeller Institute in this country. He would also worked in France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Macedonia, and Switzerland, where he had worked with and was psychoanalyzed by the great Dr. Carl Jung. He'd done significant work in an amazing number of specialties, internal medicine, high blood pressure, heart disease, tuberculosis, respiration, circulation, neurology, epidemics, especially cerebrospinal meningitis and influenza, and most recently, mental, mental illnesses. He had published three books and was a licensed psychiatrist in New York State with a private practice just off Park Avenue in the 70s and an associate professorship at Cornell and the prestigious Payne Whitney Clinic. In other words, boy, is this guy an expert witness. He had seen Chambers testify at both trials and had read some of his writings and translations. And the way we do psychiatric testimony is not for Claude Cross, as his lawyer, to ask Binger, Doctor, what do you think of this guy Chambers? Uh, the way it works, and what Judge Goddard allowed, was that Claude Cross asked Dr. Binger a so-called hypothetical question. And it begins, suppose, doctor, there was a person named Whitaker Chambers who, and then lists every unusual or spooky or bad thing that Chambers had ever done that the Hiss defense had been able to find out about that. Uh, the hypothetical question in this case was 40 pages long and took 65 minutes to read. And then Cross asked Dr. Binger, if the foregoing was true of Whitaker Chambers, would you have an opinion to a professional certainty as a psychiatrist about his mental condition. And Prosecutor Murphy was on his feet, fiercely objecting at Binger being allowed to answer. He claimed, and I think this is correct, he said this is the first time, there has never been a case before in federal court in which testimony has been allowed about the mental state of a mere witness, someone who isn't a party when that witness has never been in a mental hospital or under any treatment for any mental illness ever. And he said, Mr. He said, Judge Goddard, this is just another attempt to smear Mr. Chambers, who has been smeared enough already. And it's prejudicial even to let the question to be asked, this parade of unsavory acts and planting thoughts in the jury's mind. Now, Judge Kaufman at the first trial had allowed Binger to be asked the question, um, but he wouldn't allow Binger to answer the question, he wouldn't let him testify. He said that Chambers' credibility was certainly an issue, but the members of the jury could evaluate it based on their own experience in life. And Judge Kaufman said, I don't want to take any chance that an expert would usurp the jury's function of deciding in their own mind about Chambers' credibility. And he said, I know that, that the trend of the law is to allow more and more of this testimony, but I'm not going to do it. And that all sounds strange to me, but that's what Judge Kaufman said. This, by the way, was considered to be a major blow to the Hiss defense and, for me, disproves any idea that Judge Kaufman was prejudiced for Hiss. Well, Judge Goddard ruled the opposite way, and he said the outcome of the trial de that depends so much on the credibility of Chambers that the jury should hear about experts on the issue. And Murphy kept coming back and asking the judge to reconsider, but ultimately Judge Murphy said, pardon me, Judge Goddard said, Mr. Murphy, sit down. This isn't the end of the world. The jury doesn't have to believe a word he says. You can cross-examine him. You can put on your own shrink if you want to. I'm going to let Binger answer the question. Binger testified in a deep voice that, in his opinion, Whitaker Chambers was suffering from a mental illness called psychopathic personality. Question. Dr. Binger, what is psychopathic personality? Psychopathic personality, Binger said, is a recognized mental illness in a kind of middle ground between the psychotic and the neurotic. It is difficult to describe because it's more about the absence of something than the presence of something. It is a defect in the formation of conscience a disorder of character, I'm quoting now, of which the outstanding features are behavior of what we call an amoral or an asocial and delinquent nature, behavior which has no regard for the good of society and of individuals 
and is therefore frequently destructive of both. Dr. Binger, how do you recognize that someone is a psychopathic personality? What are the symptoms? You can say there are four symptoms, one, two, three, four, and he has all four of them, therefore he's a psychopathic personality. Binger said the primary sign of a psychopathic personality is chronic, persistent, and repetitive lying. And we also, if we find that, we look for ten other confirmatory things that are common among psychopathic personalities. Stealing, acts of deception, alcoholism and drug addiction, abnormal sexuality, panhandling, vagabondage, inability to form stable attachments, a tendency to make false accusations, bizarre behavior and impulsive acts, and neglect of personal appearance. And said Binger, I find the great majority of these behaviors in the hypothetical question. And I think the crucial opinion that Binger asserts is that psychopathic personalities make false accusations that they sincerely believe to be true, meaning Chambers really believes Hiss was a spy with him, although in fact, in truth, Hiss was not. He said, and I'm quoting, these unfortunate people have a conviction that the, of the truth and validity of their own imaginations, of their own fantasies without respect to reality, so that they play a part in life, play a role. They claim friendships where none exist, just as they will make accusations which have no basis in fact because they have a constant need to make their imaginations come true. The point is, I think, you cannot believe the accusations of such a person people like Chambers. Psychopathic personality alone creates a reasonable doubt of the truth about his testimony. Well, as I was going through all this, did you say, my God, he nailed Chambers. That's Chambers. This ties up the last loose end of a successful his defense. Well, then came cross-examination by, Professor, by uh, Murphy and um, he tried really hard to keep the doctor's testimony out, see if you think he had a good plan B. This is Murphy now questioning Binger. Doctor, isn't it true that you graduated from medical school in 1914, but were only certified as a psychiatrist in 1946? Yes. And that you were refused admission by the American Psychiatric Association because of lack of experience in psychiatry? Well, said Binger, my application was deferred, not denied. How often? Um, more than once. Now, doctor, you're not saying that, okay, so you, you've been an eminent psychiatrist for what, three years now? Okay. You're not saying that Chambers is insane, are you? No. Psychopathic personalities are capable of telling the truth. They don't lie all the time, do they? Correct. Doctor, you are acquainted with the hisses socially, aren't you? And you're not charging a fee for your testimony. He said that's correct. Isn't it possible that your opinion about this, about Chambers, is shaped to some degree by your friendship with the Hisses and your regard for them? He said, no. Um, have you ever spoken with Mr. Chambers? Binger said, no. You can't get a complete psychiatric opinion without speaking with someone, can you? Well, of course not, but I did see him testify at both trials. So I've seen other people talk to him for, I don't know, 12 days. Yes, doctor, but you were willing to give the same opinion about Chambers to the grand jury, weren't you? And at that time, you'd never laid eyes on him. And Binger said, correct. What do you know about Chambers' childhood? Binger said, practically nothing. <laughs> Isn't it important, doctor, in knowing about a person's psyche to know something about their childhood? And he said, yes, but I'm diagnosing my behavior, uh, my, uh, I, I am basing my diagnosis on behavior over a long period of time. Okay, doctor, let's get to the meat. By far the most important evidence that somebody is a psychopathic personality is chronic, persistent, and repetitive lying. Let's go through the hypothetical question and count the lies. And they went through every sentence in the hypothetical question, counting Chambers' supposedly false accusation that his was a spy as one lie, and assuming that's a lie too. They came up with a total of 20 lies that Chambers had told in his life. And the first lie he told in his life was when he was in his 20s, and he lied to the dean to get back into Columbia. 
He said, Doctor, he's a 50-year-old man who tells 20 lies in his life. And the first lie he tells in his life, he's in his 20s. Is that chronic, persistent, repetitive lying? And Binger said, well, it's not the uh, quantity of the lies that's important. It's the quality of the lies. And Murphy said, oh, so um, parents telling children that there's a Santa Claus, that wouldn't be evidence that the parents are psychopathic personalities. And Binger said, of course not. That's a part of our folk mythology. And then Murphy said, how about parents telling their children that babies are bought by the stork? Would that be a symptom that the parents are psychopathic personalities? And Binger said, well, if the parents believed it, I think it might be. I think it's seldom a good idea to crack jokes on the witness stand. And Murphy said, suppose one of our soldiers is caught in battle and becomes a POW, and the enemy interrogates him, and they ask him, where is your troop going to attack tomorrow morning, north or south? And he knows the truth is north, and he lies. He says, south. Would that lie indicate to you that our soldier, the POW, is a psychopathic personality? And Binger said, of course not. You're supposed to lie in those conditions. Well, said Murphy, let's look at some of Chambers' lies. When he was a Soviet spy, he signed a passport application and a job application saying that his occupation was writer, and he signed a loyalty oath at the end saying he was a loyal American. Now, when he was doing that, when he, a Soviet spy, was filling out an application for permits from the U.S. government, uh, wasn't he sort of like a POW being interrogated by a hostile foreign power? And didn't it make all the sense in the world for him to lie and say he was a writer, just like our, the POW would lie about where his troops were going to move tomorrow? You weren't suggesting that Chambers should have put down Soviet spy in his job app, you know, on the job application and refused to sign the loyalty oath. You also counted it as a lie when he applied for a passport under the false name of David Breen. Suppose a CIA agent, again following orders of the head of the CIA, got a passport under a false name as part of his job. Would that indicate to you that the CIA agent is a psychopathic liar? And Binger said, of course not. The agent would just be doing his job. And Murphy said, well, why is it that when a CIA agent does it, he's doing his job, and when a communist does it, he's a psychopathic liar? And Binger said, well, it all depends on what else they did in their lives. And this became a pattern. Whenever Murphy found a weak spot in what Binger had said, Binger would say, well, you have to look at all the other symptoms or all, all of the other stuff. He said, no one factor is all important. I attach no significance to any single episode. It's the totality of the picture that I pay attention to. Okay. Let's look at the confirmatory things you listed. Alcoholism, drug addiction, and abnormal, psycho- abnormal, abnormal sexuality. There's nothing in the hypothetical question that even touches on any of those things. And Binger said, correct. Uh, Murphy might have added panhandling and vagabondage, which is half the confirmatory things. And please note, he said, there's nothing in the hypothetical question about abnormal sexuality. Close call for Murphy, ethically, assuming he knew of Chambers' gay statement. Now, you also testified, Dr. Binger, that you diagnosed Mr. Chambers' mental condition in part not just from some articles he's written, all the time cover stories, but from stories and books that he translated. And Binger said, yes. Chambers translated Franz Werfel's novella, Class Reunion. And the plot of this is that a man ruins the life of a former friend by making false accusations against him. And I find, I I noted, I was struck by the fact that the victim of the false accusation is named Adler, and he has a ludicrous walk when seen from behind. And Binger said, I was struck by the extraordinary analogies between the plot of class reunion and Chambers' accusations against Hiss. It seems that Dr. Binger thinks that a plot Chambers translated suggested behavior to Chambers, and Chambers behaved like the false accuser in real life, making false accusations against Hiss. This doesn't fit into any of the criteria that Dr. Binger has set out for psychopathic personality, but maybe it fit the conclusion he wanted to reach so much that he threw it in, even though, though it doesn't have any professional validity. Well, Chambers wrote cover stories for Time Magazine, Doctor, about the Pope and Albert Einstein. If you're right that he's very susceptible to stuff he reads and writes, uh, why isn't he going around issuing papal encyclicals and formulating theories of general 
relativity. Or to get back to what he's translated, do you know any other books Chambers has translated? And Binger said, no. Here's one. I wonder if you'd like to predict his behavior based on the plot of this one. Bambi. Why isn't Chambers out in the woods looking for Thumper if he's so suggestible by the plots of the books he translated? Binger said, I have other things to do. I didn't read everything Mr. Chambers wrote. Now, Dr. Binger, you said that in your direct testimony, uh, you faulted Chambers for his, something he did at the first trial. He said that when Lloyd Paul Stryker was taking him through all the times he lied under oath, he showed no contrition or remorse for all his false testimonies. Doctor, are you so extraordinary a psychiatrist that you can tell at a distance of 25 feet what someone is feeling? And Binger said no. Now, Dr. Binger, you testified that one of the confirmatory things of Chambers' psychopathic personality was that he was unable to form stable attachments. And Binger said yes. This is a man who's been working for Time Magazine for 10 years and has been married to the same woman for 19 years. You're saying he's unable to form stable attachments? And Binger said, uh, I don't know the quality of the marriage. And he was unstable in his relationship with the Communist Party, in again, then out again. Speaking of instability, the doctor, uh, during your medical career, you've practiced in different countries and different states and numerous specialties. The man in the hypothetical question is steady Eddie compared to you. You think you might have, by your own criteria, difficulty in forming stable relationships and you might be a psychopathic personality? Binger said no. Okay, let's discuss another confirmatory thing. Inattention to personal appearance. Oh, dear. Thomas Edison, Will Rogers, Albert Einstein. Are they psychopathic personalities? And Binger said, I saw Einstein once at Harvard and he was well dressed. I've never looked at Will Rogers' linen. Okay, let's discuss another confirmatory thing. Uh, bizarre behavior and impulsive acts. One of them you mentioned was Chambers at Williams College skipping a student dinner so he could read the Bible. Is it bizarre behavior, in your opinion, for a troubled college student to be reading the Bible? Does that indicate to you that he's a psychopathic personality? And what Binger should have said was, but he was supposed to be at the dinner. But instead, Binger said, well, he thought he was an atheist at that point. Oh, so in your opinion, an atheist reading the Bible, that's a sign that he's a psychopathic personality. You mentioned Chambers being bizarre, more bizarre behavior, by getting rid of a typewriter by leaving it on a New York subway. How about all the married women who go to Reno to get quickie divorces, and they go to the Virginia Street Bridge and throw their wedding rings into the Truckee River? Are they psychopaths? Binger said, I, I don't know that that happens. How about the most bizarre behavior you cited, Chambers hiding spy documents in a pumpkin? It was a very good place to hide them. Nobody would have thought of looking there. How about when Moses' mother hid him in the bulrushes to keep him from being found and killed by, by Pharaoh? Was that a confirmatory thing that he was a psychopathic personality? How about the founders of the state of Connecticut hiding the state charter in an oak tree to keep it from falling into the hands of the British? Were the founders of the state of Connecticut psychopathic personalities? And Binger said, well, Moses' mother could hardly have put him in a safe deposit vault. I, I don't know the circumstances, and I wouldn't know where else she had to hide, hide the child. Doctor, isn't it true that psychopathic personality is a rather vague term, a sort of wastebasket classification for a lot of symptoms that don't fit anywhere else? And remarkably, Binger said, well, I think that's fair. Isn't there a book about psychiatry published in 1990, 1944, doctor, that says the concept of psychopathic personality is highly unsatisfactory and useless in psychiatric research? And Binger said, yes. And I agree with every word. I think it's excellent. Doctor, you also testified on direct that an indication to you that Chambers was detached from reality was that he looked up at the ceiling frequently. Doctor, we kept a time, we kept a count of how many times you've looked up at the ceiling in the last 50 minutes. 59 times. Doctor, by your own standards, 
Aren't you more a psychopathic personality than Chambers? One member of the jury laughed at this point. Binger said, not on that ground alone. You also testified that another indication that Chambers is detached from reality is that when he was asked questions that called for a simple factual answer like, it was Tuesday, he began his answers with conditional phrases like, it must have been Tuesday, or it could have been, or would have been, or should have been. You think that's a con that shows he's a psychopath? Do you know how many times Chambers used those same phrases in 717 pages of testimony? And Binger said, yes, 10 times. And Murphy said, do you know how many times Alger Hiss used those same phrases in 590 pages of testimony? Binger said, no. And Murphy said, 158 times. Doctor, by your own standards, isn't Alger Hiss more than 15 times the psychopathic liar that Whitaker Chambers is? And Binger said, I form no conclusions from the use of those phrases. Last question. Doctor, you've testified that psychopathic personalities care nothing for the feelings of others and therefore often hurt them. Are you aware of a single instance, in all the things you've been told about Whitaker Chambers' life, that he has ever deliberately and vengefully hurt a friend? And Binger said no. And that was the end of Dr. Binger's cross-examination. And... Uh, Professor Younger used to say there was nothing left of Dr. Binger, what, n not even mincemeat. Now, people I know and whose opinions I trust have told me that he did great things in his private practice. My own opinion is that what he tried to do in that courtroom was witchcraft, and he deserved every bit of humiliation he got. I think this was a disaster for the Hiss defense. Um, first of all, it's what you've just heard in the last few minutes. He was just torn to shreds. Um, Professor Younger, when he used to lecture about this case, said that when he was a, a, a young lawyer, he knew that Murphy was a great trial lawyer. Um, and Murphy knows, like all great trial lawyers do, that cross-examination should generally be short and sweet. But he said, Murphy cross-examined Binger for three days. And I always wondered why he took so long. Then I read the cross, and I realized Murphy couldn't stop. He was having too much fun. Um, Murphy's cross-examination of Binger has been published in book form to teach law students how to destroy the other side's expert witness, or uh, you know, don't put on this kind of expert witness for your own side. Professor Younger called it the most devastating cross-examination of a psychiatrist ever. Second, it left glaringly obvious a failure of the Hiss defense to explain what motive Chambers has for lying. They couldn't think of any rational motive for him to lie and their attempt to give him an irrational motive blew up in their faces. More importantly, Chambers could not explain, pardon me, Dr. Binger could not explain Chambers' possession of the documents. Uh, Alastair Cook, who was very sympathetic to Hiss and to Binger, wrote that he was rather like a magician who'd been hired to perform at a children's birthday party. He'd pulled strange and frightening objects from his top hat, but he had not performed the really necessary task, which was to make the documents disappear. But perhaps the deepest self-inflicted wound of the psychiatric testimony, and maybe I'm being too philosophical here, was I think it may have undermined one of the foundations of the Hiss defense. That uh, is Hiss's sterling reputation and his appearance, and look at this man. Does this man look like a communist? Uh, Binger's testimony was that Chambers may look like a conscience-stricken patriot and journalist, but he's really a nutcase. Take that up one level of abstraction. Is saying, he's saying, the his defense is saying, it's possible to appear to be one thing and yet in reality to be another, much more sinister thing. And if that can be true of Chambers, why can't that also be true of his? If Whitaker Chambers may look like a prodigal son returning to the country of his birth, but he's really a psychopathic personality, then why isn't it just as possible that Alger Hiss may look like a distinguished diplomat, but he's really a Soviet spy?